portion of it we're looking at, because we will come back to confession and forgiveness and forgive, finish that service. But I am inviting you to pull out Luke chapter 4, your handouts for today. Let us hear the scripture for this, the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And also the first Sunday for our campaign of We Really Do Need Each Other, A Place to Meet. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was very hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. So the devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world, and he said to him, I will give you all of the authority and splendor it has given to, been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus said, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, serve only him. The devil then led him up to Jerusalem and had him stand in the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to a test. And so when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Bless our time together, O God. Inspire these words that they may be your words. That the words of my mouth, the inspiration of those hearts that are present, might be acceptable, O Lord, our strength and redeem in your sight. For it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, you're welcome to pull out your handouts that are appointed for today. And this again for our lesson entitled, We Really Do Need Each Other, A Place to Meet. And so that's what it should say. For those online, you're welcome to download that on one of our Facebook pages. If you want to catch this later, the sermon and the uh, handout will be uploaded to our website a little bit later today or tomorrow. And so you're welcome to follow along again from that if you'd like. But again, those watching, just go to our, website, our Facebook pages. And I have a JPEG for each one of these handouts for today. Just want to start, since this is the uh, season of Lent, and here we are, the very first Sunday in the season of Lent, reminds me of a story that was told to me about a young boy who was a little bit confused because he'd come to Ash Wednesday service and had the ashes put on his forehead and told those words that the pastors always say, remember that you are dust, dust and to dust you shall return. So he and his mom had some exchanges about this on the drive home, and he was a little bit confused about what that meant and just about what mortality meant. You know, when you're younger, you just don't believe that you're going to die. And he always thought you always existed, and you are the center of the universe. And so he starts getting a handle on what life means and what death means and all these things. And he goes into his room when he and his mom get home, and he's sitting contemplating things. And then half an hour later, he comes out to find his mom. He says, Mom, am I understanding this that... Before I existed, I was nothing but dust. She said, that's right, honey, that's true. He said, when I die, I'm going to be dust again. He said, that's correct, honey. He said, well, we might be in some trouble. She said, why? Well, because I looked under my bed, and either somebody's coming or going, I'm not sure which. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's my best Latin joke. Come on, it's a little bit fun. <laughs> Today is is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Didn't you notice that it doesn't say the first Sunday of Lent? And there's a reason for that. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of our season of Lent, and it goes through Holy Saturday, and it's meant to be a 40-day season of reflection. Now, for those who are sharper tools in the shed than I am, already you're thinking about this and saying, wait a minute. Ash Wednesday to the Saturday before Easter is not 40 days. It's 40 Six days, because you're smart. I know you are. But you need to remember that Sunday is always a mini Easter celebration. We live on the, this side of the resurrection. We can't deny that Jesus Christ rose again. And who would want to? It's great news. And so every Sunday, regardless of the season in which we find ourselves, is always considered to be a celebration day. So I want to also tell you this. This is true. When the church actually started this 40-day observation of Lent, and they often would have a very severe diet or fast during the week and so forth, those six days, Monday through Saturday, they would celebrate on Sunday. So I am outright telling you, if you want to break your fast today that you happen to be on, there's nothing legalistic whether you are or not, 
But if you are on a fast and you are fasting from something during the season of Lent, Sunday is not season, a day in season of Lent. It's in its day of Lent, but is not of Lent. Therefore, go celebrate. It's always a mini Easter celebration, for we believe that Christ is risen. So let's take a look at this. 40 days. What does it mean to have 40 days? You already heard the lesson of Jesus uh, going into the wilderness and being driven into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting. And some people often will ask me, and I get this question all the time, did Jesus really not drink any water, eat anything during 40 straight days? Let me ask you, what would happen to you if you didn't drink any water, eat any food for 40 straight days? You would be, anybody? Dead, right? So here's my question for you. Wasn't Jesus a human being? The answer to that is yes. Is there any indication that something miraculous is happening here? The indication is no. In fact, the whole point is for Jesus not to do anything miraculous and to be dependent as everybody else is in these 40 days. So what do you think the chances of Jesus not having eaten or, or having had anything to drink during 40 straight days and nights? Like zero. You see, you have to understand there is a Jewish tradition that they would often fast for extended periods of time. But what they do is they often drink a little bit of water during the day to keep themselves hydrated. Not much, but at nighttime they would eat a very light fare of maybe some nuts or some, uh, uh, some dates or something like that. Just enough to fuel their body and to keep them alive during the time of fasting. I am very, it is very likely, and I'm convinced that that's likely what Jesus did, but that doesn't mean he didn't lose a lot of weight, and that doesn't mean that he didn't go very, very hungry. Now, again, I just believe that Jesus was human after all, and therefore struggled with the same types of things and limitations that we did. But we go on, why 40 days? 40 days is obviously a very significant number in the Bible, it's a, it usually refers to a long, lengthy period of testing and time. And during these 40 days, we are told that Jesus faced, uh, uh, faced three different tests that came up against him from the one that we call the devil. Now, literally translate, do you know what the devil means? It really means the adversary or the cross-examiner. If I were translating this into contemporary English so we could communicate to you the way the Jews understood the devil, the phrase devil, or this cross-examiner, I would translate it, are you ready? Lawyer. Because that's what a lawyer was. They were called devils. They were the cross-examiners. So if you got a lawyer and hired him in Jewish culture, you would be calling him the devil because that's what he is. There you go. You thought that lawyers were devils, now you know the Bible says so. So going on. So what are the three tests that Jesus faced? First of all, he was tested with the temptation of comfort. Nothing wrong with comfort, but Jesus had fasted after all for 40 days and he was getting really hungry. And he was told by the devil, rightly so, you know, you can do something miraculous and turn that stone into bread, but the cost of doing so for Jesus would have been disobedience. Jesus came to identify with our struggles, our hardships, and pains. That's why Jesus struggled and suffered in the same way in those 40 days that we would have. And he chose not to address his physical needs in a miraculous way. So that he could see and understand the same type of travails through which you go as a human being. Two, pride. So the devil took him and said, hey, just bow your knee to me and you don't have to go through any suffering. And I will make you ruler of everything that you see. But the cost of doing this... And that pride for Jesus would have been arrogance. Don't we have enough arrogant leaders right now in our world and in our country? Uh, the answer to that is yes. It's a rhetorical question that we all know the answer to. Jesus would have just been like every other ruler who uses his power to alienate and oppress everybody with whom he disagrees if he had just given himself over to that. We don't need a Jesus like that. So Jesus rejects that. The third thing he rejects is the taking of shortcuts. He was told, hey, Jesus, let's go up to the pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down, and you can do something spectacular. The angel will save you, and you can kind of swoop down. You'll be like Superman. It will be awesome. Everybody will bow their heads. It will be a very public spectacle. It will be awesome. But here's the problem with the cost. The cost of taking a shortcut for Jesus would have been a loss of his integrity. Shortcuts would have precluded his trip ultimately to the cross as well, and that would have been a very sad thing for you and me. 
So what's the cost of Jesus losing his integrity and taking a shortcut? You and I would not have the gift of salvation. And so Jesus rejected these things, and, and so this is the beginning of our lesson and our stories about this season of Lent. And you might get from the impression then that the season of Lent is all about going into a quiet place, into a space where you do some personal devotion, and you withdraw yourself from the world, and you would be wrong. You didn't hear the lesson that I read today, did you? I'm going to prove to you that Jesus did not go out into the desert by himself. In fact, Jesus never went anywhere by himself ever. And I'm going to prove it to you. Number one, we know that he had, first of all, his mother who followed him everywhere. Obviously, she didn't go out into the desert with him here. She wasn't there. So she's not the person who was with him, right? So secondly, he always took his disciples whenever he could. When he finally recruited disciples, they weren't there in the wilderness with him. So Jesus was alone, right? Let me read you what the Bible says. Luke is very specific about making sure you and I understand this. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into wilderness. Did Jesus go by himself into the wilderness? Oh no. Jesus went with the gift of the Spirit. You see, here's the problem. It appears as though Jesus faces his journey alone and his testing alone, and this has led us to a very individualistic, overly individualistic understanding of the season of Lent and our relationship with God as though it's just God and me and love and I get it, okay? But we're forgetting that Jesus was always communally related to somebody. And in particular, look at letter C undergoing it alone, number one. We have this individualistic and theologically incorrect understanding of who Jesus is, as though he walked this journey of life all by himself. He never walked anywhere by himself. It's a misunderstanding of the nature of Jesus, because Jesus is always in relationship with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus is never alone, and this is intentional that Luke points us out, so it is an example for us. You know what your problem is when you fail a test? When you don't succeed at something in life, when you have these moral failures that are staring you in the face and you just cannot have uh, victory over them, I'll tell you why. Because you're trying to do it by yourself. Jesus didn't even do it by himself. Jesus didn't face the temptation without somebody being present with him. And in this case, it was the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you are really foolish if you think you're going to face the challenges of your life by yourself. Isn't that sweet how I turned that into a thing? A lesson looks like it's about individual piety into one that's about community because the Bible tells us this is about Christ communing with the Holy Spirit and therefore having the strength he needs to resist the temptations that he faced. Look at number two under going alone. Jesus had success against the temptations of life because Jesus was never alone. I'm going to prove that to you, that that's Luke's intention in the Gospel of Luke. When Jesus was baptized, who was there? Oh, hundreds of people and his cousin, right? John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't go off and dedicate himself. He, should, he could have. He had the right to go out to the waters and just dedicate himself. I dedicate myself. There you go. He didn't do that. He did it very publicly. He submitted himself. He humiliated himself. He did it in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. Because he needed to do it in front of others to make that covenant and that commitment. His lineage, right after we are told that Jesus baptized, Luke goes into this big lineage of Jesus. And you need to read it because it's really inspiring. Because what he does is he starts with Jesus and goes to Joseph and then works all the way back to the hand of God. What he's trying to show, show is that Jesus is connected to a larger tapestry of life, to the community of faith to the tapestry of humanity. Jesus isn't some isolated lone wolf somewhere. So again, it's Luke's point that Jesus is always communally related and interconnected. The calling of the disciples follows immediately after that. He calls his disciples, so wherever he goes in his ministry, guess what? Jesus has somebody by his side. In the transfiguration, Jesus doesn't go up in a quiet place by himself. Who does he take? We just looked at this last week. Peter, James, and John. Who does he meet up in the mountain? 
Elijah and Moses. It's a busy place up there in the mountain on the Transfiguration Day. It's getting awfully crowded, isn't it? Because Jesus never goes alone. Oh, I didn't even include the Father and the Spirit that were also there and make themselves known. So it's a crowded place on the mountaintop. It's not a quiet retreat away from people. Jesus always brings somebody with him. Hey, what happens when Jesus then wants to teach us how to pray? Did you notice how Jesus taught us to pray? He said, when you pray, pray in this way. My Father who art in heaven. That isn't what he said, is it? Mm -mm. What did he say? This Our. is the model prayer, remember? It's Our. Our Father who art in heaven. Prayer is a communal activity. We pray together. It is our Father. It is an acknowledgement ultimately in prayer. You probably never thought of this. Because oftentimes you might go into your wherever. It's okay to pray by yourself. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But you always need to realize that the purpose of prayer is ultimately to connect us to God and to each other. If your prayer life isn't oriented around connecting you to God and ultimately other people, you're missing the point of prayer. It's about our Father and our relationship with each other. Do you remember all the other petitions in the Lord's Prayer? Because they're almost all relationally oriented about my relationship with God and you. It's not about me and my personal little problems. It's about us and how we face the challenges of life together. So that's a model prayer. We go on. How about the Holy Sacraments? What does Jesus do right before he's betrayed? Oh, he's not thinking about himself and going in a broom closet by himself somewhere. He, in front of his disciples, takes bread and wine and breaks and says, This is my body broken for you. This is my, this is my blood shed for you. And he gives it to them to remind them that he's always physically and always, and always spiritually present with them, regardless of the circumstances. And notice that we don't call it holy individualistic meal. It's called what again? Holy communion. communion. We are communing with God. We are communing with each other. <clears throat> and that is important. There's no such thing as individual communion. There's nothing more offensive to me than I, and I've actually seen this online. Individual communion says. So you can take individual communion at home by yourself. It's a little grape juice container with a little wafer that you can take by yourself at home. That is the dumbest thing I have ever seen. All right? That's like jumbo shrimp. Oh, wait a minute. There is a thing like jumbo shrimp. Kind of a contradictory word, isn't it? There are actually pretty big shrimp. But it is a contradictory thing to say, I'm going to take individual communion. How stupid is that? That's like saying, I'm going to go drive on the parkway. Oh, I guess we do say that one too, don't we? Okay. But this is a contradiction. There's no such thing as individual communion. There always has to be two or more. Yeah. Then lastly, Jesus' passion. Even to the cross, we often think that Jesus was alone in his passion. Jesus was not alone. Who was there? His mom, Mary Magdalene, John, his beloved disciple. Jesus didn't even go to the passion alone. He had support and love. And so I want to point out to you, I took this lesson that we often take as this individualistic, pietistic lesson about me going off out in my broom closet somewhere away from people, and I want you to rethink Lent. Lent is not about you doing something personal by yourself away from other people. I want you to rethink Lent and realize that Lent is about you finding other people on the journey with you and walking with them. Because that's what the Lenten opportunity is all about. It is an opportunity so for us to, it's a place and a time for us to meet with Jesus and with other people who are on this journey of faith along the way. So Lent is about meeting together, sharing our faith, shouldering each other's burdens. Understand that we are <coughs> gathered here to take this journey together. Reminding ourselves that Jesus is always in relationship with God, with us. And therefore, we need to reject this overly pietistic, individualistic faith. Where do you think that comes from? From our American values. See, sometimes our American values are just in contradiction to our Christian faith. And I shouldn't just pick on America, because it's every other country too, by the way. We should be countercultural, and we should be all about 
relationships with other people and reject this individualistic, pietistic faith that has called itself Christianity and because that is not Christian. I want to tell you two quick, one quick story, one a little lengthier story. Quick story is this. When I came here 25 years ago, by the way, yes, I keep reminding people of that, 20 flipping five years ago, I've been in this congregation, and God has been very good. But I remember when I first came here, I visited every single member of the parish, and one of the men I talked to was on council, and I went to their house, I wanted to see where everybody was at, where their faith, and I looked at the, the man at the time, and I said, you know, uh, tell me a little bit about your faith. Tell me what your faith in God means to you. And he looked at me very sternly. And his face started getting red. And he said, it's none of your business, pastor. I'm like, okay. I thought faith is our business. Your faith and your faith and your faith and your faith. It is my business. And my faith is your business. Because we're in this journey together. And so now I want to tell you a positive story. True story about a guy uh, named Edmund, oh, I'm going to have to look it up because now I forget his last name. Edmund Ernest, Edmund, goodness, Ernest Gordon. You probably do not know that name. Ernest Gordon wrote a book entitled The Miracle on River Kwai. Ernest Gordon was a British soldier in World War II. His battalion was captured by the Japanese. He became a prisoner of war for many, many years. Maybe you've heard of the movie A Bridge on River Kwai, which is honestly a very inaccurate portrayal of what happened over the building of the Bridge of River Kwai. And it does not at all capture how gruesome it is. If you want to see something that captures a little bit more about the difficulty of what Ernest Gordon went through, there's a movie about him entitled To End All Wars. You can put that down in your notes if you would like. I encourage you to watch it. It is a very inspirational movie, To End All Wars. But even that movie doesn't capture how gruesome it was. Let me tell you what this man faced. He and hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war, Dutch, French, American, British, they were all marched out to this place where they were supposed to build this bridge over the river that was going to help the Japanese supply line so they could supply Burma and China and their, keep their military uh, going and so forth. And so they built this bridge on the backs of all of these men. It was, they, they were basically naked outside of a loincloth. They had no shoes, no socks. They had a, they had a blanket, that's it. So they had one cloth and a blanket. That's all any of these men had to their name and a little bowl in which they were given a little bit of broth every single day to eat. That's all they had. So you can imagine walking on rocks and walking through trees and walking through shrubs and swinging a machete and cutting down uh, all sorts of uh, 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 trees and, and bushes and so forth and brush <clears throat> and walking through thistles and thorns and being bit by mosquitoes uh, these guys died of diphtheria, they were run through with swords, they were beheaded, they dropped dead of malnourishment. In fact, in the time that it took to build this bridge, 80 to 90,000 men died. Are you ready for this? 395 men per mile died in the building of this bridge and the, the trail that went to that bridge. It was a terrible, awful tragedy. Now, what happened to these men, or people like Ernest Gordon in, in the circumstance? What happens to humanity? What happens to civilization? Well, they developed what they called jungle law. Jungle law was this. If you're sitting there and you're falling asleep and you've got your bowl because you're so tired, I'm going to come and take your bowl and pour your food in mine. If you are, are not going to survive the night, I'm grabbing your blanket. If you die an extra hour earlier, who cares? If you're not comfortable, I take care of me. That's what developed in these prison camps. It was all about me, taking care of me. Until all of a sudden, there was one guy by the name of Angus. And yes, that was his last name, Angus. Angus Beef. I don't know. Angus was his name. He had a good friend named Argyle. I'm not making this up. His best friend, Argyle, was dying. 
And so everybody came and stripped him of his blankets, of, his of, of the loincloth that he had. He was completely naked. Took all of his food because every little bit of food helps you survive, right? And so that man was shivering and dying, had diphtheria. He was going to die. His friend Agnes came up, gave him his blanket, covered him, and gave him his food that day in his portion of water. And the next day, and the next day, Angus cared for this man every single day until he nurtured Argyle back to health. Isn't that amazing? But there was a cost to this. Angus died. He starved to death. And it's a sad story. But a lot of men saw Argyle come back to life. And they said, maybe we've been thinking about this jungle law the wrong way. So it changed some people. And it was for the benefit of Ernest Gordon, the hero of the story that I'm telling, because some of his friends saw what happened to Argyle and the sacrifice that Angus made so that his friend might live. Because Ernest was put in one of the death houses. That's what happens to a person. He had diphtheria. They said, he's not going to live. Some, of it, some people, the Japanese just threw him in the death house where it just stunk and bodies were piled up on each other until they were dead. They just stayed there until they died. His friends came in and got him, built a little shelter over top of his head, and they took him away from all the stench as far away as they could possibly get him, and they started bringing their food and water to feed him, and they nourished him back to health. Ernest was so inspired, he'd given up his faith in God. But this inspired him to open up the Bible. He started reading. He started reading that passage of Scripture. Greater love hath no man than this. That he gave his life for another. And so he started preaching this message, became the unofficial chaplain. There were about a thousand men in his camp, I believe it was. And he started preaching this message. And this whole camp was transformed. They decided to change jungle law to gospel law. They said, from here on out, if somebody's sick and somebody's in need, we are going to take our food and all of us collectively are going to nurse that person back to health. We are going to make sure the person who's freezing cold gets our blankets. We're going to make sure that everybody who's on the, on the, the risk between death and life is going to get every opportunity to live. And we're going to make sure it happens. And here's the amazing thing that happened. That camp, at the end of the war, when it was liberated, more, in fact, 50% more survived in that camp than at any other camp in the surrounding areas. And they probably had the most brutal Japanese jailer of any of the camps that beat them mercilessly. In fact, there are stories that they told that horrendous how that, that, you know, they thought the Japanese jailer was missing a tool and said, where's the tool? Who stole it? Nobody stole the tool. It just got misplaced or whatever. And finally, one guy stand up because he didn't want anybody else to get murdered because they were going to come out and just gun them all down. He said, I stole it. The guy got beaten to death, but he gave his life so everybody else could survive. This is the mentality that this camp developed, and as a result, more people survived than at any of the other camps. What does it tell you about faith? You see, faith is meant to be done in relationship to other people. If you've been trying to live your life and your faith away from other people because, you know, people are messy. Yeah, they are. But you're not going to survive. You cannot survive without others. I'm going to turn a phrase on you right now, and I'm going to say this the way it should be said. God always gives us more than we can handle. Did you hear me? I'm going to say it again. God always gives us more than we can handle. We've always said it the opposite way, haven't we? God never will give you more than you can handle. God must have a high opinion of me, blah, blah, blah. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. God gives us more than we can handle. If we try to go alone, we will always be overwhelmed by the storms of life. In fact, that phrase, God gives us, never gives us more than we can handle, is not a biblical phrase. You can't find it in the Bible. Now, there is a, uh, a passage in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, you can look it up, that seems to say that, but that's not what that passage means. You can read my explanation from that. 
down below that. What God does do is when we are overwhelmed by the challenges of life, guess what God does? He gives us each other so we can help each other out. We may not be able to face all the challenges in our life by ourselves, but we can face every challenge in life when we are in fellowship with other people. Because after all, the business of the Christian is, guess who? Each other. It's other people. So if you're going to face the tests and challenges of this life, if you're going to set about on this faith journey, if you're going to use this Lenten season the way it should be used, it's not about going into your own broom closet and alienating yourself from others. It's all about connecting with people, other Christians who are on this journey of faith with you to include other people along the way and in your journey so that when you are overwhelmed by the storms and the burdens of life, you've got somebody else to help you. And so when somebody else is overwhelmed by the storms and challenges of life, you are there for them. After all, this is a place for us to meet in that journey along the way. I want to end with a quote by Reuben Welsh. Reuben Welsh is an author of a book entitled We Really Do Need Each Other. He's actually a very fine biblical and Greek scholar from California back in the 60s and 70s. He's still living. He's in his 90s right now. But he wrote quite a few books about John and about the book of 1 John. And my wife and I, this book, We Really Do Need Each Other, I believe was probably one of our very first devotional studies that we did together. We read this book, and it stuck with me. It made an impression on me. And so that's why I'm writing a campaign on this 40 Days of Community based upon some of what Reuben Welsh taught me. And so this is one of the things he wrote in his book. I myself am on my own journey. I don't come to you out of a vacuum. I'm in the process of my own pilgrimage. And I know that you don't come out of a vacuum either. That you are on your journey. And what I believe with all my heart is that in the grace and mercy of God, our providential meeting together can be God's time for some new and fresh thing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that you brought us here together today for a reason. This is a place for us to meet along the way in our journey. And you do not ask us to go on this journey alone. You've invited us to go with each other. We've got partners. You've promised to be present with us as well. So as we embark on this 40-day journey together, may that word be most important, that we do it together. May we also use this as an inspiration for the rest of our lives, so we understand how much better things are when we live a life of faith together in fellowship with one another. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.